All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of To Your Health here on Facebook Live. I am your host, John Lazarou. Okay, so 15 years ago, if I told you that type 2 diabetes was going to become an issue with our youth in our nation, you would have looked at me and said, Lazarou has lost it again. And you know what? You probably would have been right back then, but not today, okay? There's an alarming statistic that came out of a, a research that was done with JAMA that found that there are 3,700 3, new cases of type 2 diabetes in children. Now, type 2 diabetes is normally referred to as adult onset diabetes. So you can see where the problem is here, that this type of diabetes, which will explain the difference between type 1 and type 2, is happening in our youth. And this is why it's important for parents to know how to talk to their children about their diabetes and what parents can do to avoid type 1, type 2 diabetes, and if they do have it, how they can help their child. Joining us today to provide us with a plethora of information <laughs> is Dr. Rebecca Dennison, who is a doctor of integrative medicine. I want to make sure I get this all right. A dietitian and a diabetes educator with the Gecko Diabetes and Nutrition Center at GBMC. Dr. Dennison, I want to thank you for joining us today. we got a lot to get to, so why don't we get started, all right? All right. We referred to type 1 and type 2 diabetes, right? We talked about how type 2 diabetes is becoming more prevalent among children, but let's go, let's take a step back. Explain to us, what is the difference between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes? Okay, so first I want to explain that they're both an insulin issue. So insulin job is to pull the blood sugar from the bloodstream into the cell and just like gas has to get from a gas tank to the engine insulin has to get the blood sugar from the bloodstream into the cell in type 1 diabetes it's an autoimmune disease and something has happened that's caused the body to fight against the cells that make insulin they effectively destroy it and so those individuals are no longer able to make insulin at all in type 2 diabetes it's a little bit like the locks got changed on the cell but not all the insulin got the new keys so you've got insulin there, but it's not working. The official term is insulin resistance. And so that's, there's the difference between the two. Okay. So let's, um, I want to talk about the blood sugar levels since we talk, you know, we're referring to diabetes. So let me just try to put this in certain perspective for our audience and those watching us on, on Facebook. What are the normal blood sugar levels in children? And what are the blood sugar levels that you, that you might find in a child that might have di type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes? So in a child that does not have diabetes, their blood sugars would be anywhere from like 70, 80 to 140, 150, depending on whether they've eaten recently or not. So your blood sugar is going to go up after you eat. It's supposed to. <laughs> you fill the gas tank up with gas. Um, so the second part was what their blood sugars would be if they had diabetes. And that is, um, it depends. I mean, it's gonna be higher than that. So a diagnosis would be if you had a over 200 blood sugar, random, not depending on whether you ate or not, over, over 126 blood sugar if you've not eaten in eight hours or more. Okay. Joining us today is Dr. Rebecca Dennison, uh, integrative medicine expert and dietitian and diabetes educator with the Gecko uh, Diabetes and Nutrition Center at GBMC. Did I get that right? You got that oh, perfect. Yeah, that's good. That's yes. good. <laughs> All right. Um, let me ask you this. What are some of the risks, uh, factors, and causes of type 2 diabetes in children? So a lot of people are familiar with many of them. I'm going to add some other ones. But the ones that I expect most population is going to know, overweight, being inactive, not eating well, eating a lot of processed foods, eating inconsistently, those kind of things. But there's also just a general lifestyle that some people don't think about. We need to get enough sleep, <laughs> and we need to have um, stress in our lives well managed. <laughs> and so instead of getting always asking for that cortisol to kick in and get us through that last little bit, we need to have this balanced lifestyle that we seem to have lost a little bit. You know, sure. <laughs> people don't think about those as being risk factors for that, but they are. I encourage those members watching us at, at, on, on Facebook in our studio audience. If you have any questions for Dr. Dennison, please feel free on Facebook to submit them in the comment section. And our audience members, please raise your hand and one of our uh, assistants will come to you to, to get your question. Um, let's talk about warning signs and symptoms. What are some of the warning signs and symptoms 
of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes in kids, and are they different than adults? So they're really about the same. They can be more intense in children, and they tend to be more intense in children with type 1 diabetes versus type 2. But the general beginning warning signs is unexpected weight loss. So you're not trying to lose weight. Most children aren't. So in adults, um, if you're trying to lose weight, that's understandable. But if you're not, and all of a sudden you've lost 20 or 30 pounds in a short time period, that's actually an, a symptom of um, diabetes. Uh, blurred vision, having to go to the bathroom all the time, excessive thirst, and if you're a child, bedwetting. Now, as it gets more intense, more for type 1, but it can be a type 2, then you move into what may progress into diabetic ketoacidosis. So that can be extreme lethargy that could lead to unconsciousness. It can be a fruity odor on the breath. It can be having labored breathing and nausea and vomiting. Let's talk about treatment options for, for, for a minute. Um, is the treatment options for a child with type 2 diabetes the same or different than a child with type 1 diabetes? So they're slightly different because a type 1 person, child, has to have insulin because they have no other options. Their body has effectively destroyed the insulin-making cells in the body. So those individuals have to have insulin. Um, they're a bit wary of what um, oral medications for children, but they do give oral meds for children. Both can have lifestyle changes. A type 1 patient typically does not need to lose weight, but now sometimes there's a combination of type 1 and overweight. But generally, type 1 person, child or adult, is underweight or normal weight, and a type 2 is overweight. What could be, we, you know, we, in the intro, I talked about the obesity epidemic as being one of the reasons why we've seen an increase of type 2 diabetes among our nation's uh, youth. What could be some of the other reasons we've seen possible uh, increase in type 2 diabetes? And what are some of those treatment options? Again, you know, are the treatment options the same or different for type 1 and type 2? So the treatment options are Lifestyle is the same for both of them, but there's a little bit of a difference depending on if they're on insulin versus not on insulin. Maybe you want your carbohydrates at the time that they're actually taking insulin, and maybe your snacks shouldn't have any carbohydrates or have less in carbohydrates in them. But as a rule of thumb, you want a balanced intake of some carbs and some proteins and some fats about every two to six hours, somewhere in that time period. Um, and I forgot the rest of your question. No, uh, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It was talking about the, the treatment options. Uh -huh. let, let me just go back for one more thing. Can type 1 or type 2 diabetes in children ever be cured? Is there a cure for that? What, can, can they, is it the change of lifestyle? They can, I don't want to say make it go mm -hmm. away. Can it go away? Or what are, I mean, is there a cure? So there is not a cure for type 1 diabetes at this time. Um, there is occasional pancreatic um, transplants in either a type 1 or a type 2 and some people could call that a cure um, and usually um, if you got a pancreas that's working then it would be but there is a lot of wording out there of it the, that you've they've cured diabetes the people that have the bariatric surgeries and lost 100 pounds but if they start gaining the weight back eating the wrong way being less active it's gonna come back so in my opinion it's either in remission or it's in control. I don't personally use the word cure for type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joining us today is Dr. Rebecca Dennison, Doctor of Integrative Medicine, a dietitian, and a diabetes educator with the Geckel Diabetes and Nutrition Center at GBMC. I encourage our audience members, if you have a question, please uh, ask it. Those at home or at work that are watching us on Facebook Live, please provide your uh, question in the comment section of our Facebook uh, page. You know, earlier we talked about parents and their role with regards to their kids and, and, and diabetes. How do parents um, explain to kids about diabetes and the different types, like type 1 and type 2? How do parents talk to their kids about type 1 and type 2 diabetes? So I think a child with type 1 diabetes, a best way to explain to that child is you're missing something that your body needs, and we're going to give that to you in some medication. So their, their body is not making something that they're needing, and 
there is medication, and that's great that there is medication because 100 years ago there wasn't. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> with a type 2 diabetes, um, you could explain that there's something that's not working really well in the body, and we need to be doing things that help that work better. So exercise movement helps things work better. It helps the insulin work better. Most kids generally are active, but now that we have the cell phones and all the games, <laughs> it's a little bit harder. <laughs> the, when, I know when I was young, everyone was active. We didn't have all that stuff. So um, it should be about two hours of screen time. Okay. And I'm sure that many people have more than that. Uh, one of the questions that came in, um, said, they ask is, how can a parent best manage, since you talked about insulin injections, and blood sugar test if they have a child who fears <laughs> shots and needles? Well, that is a challenge. <laughs> so there are a lot of different techniques. Um, as far as taking your blood sugar, there are um, a device that um, has the needles inside a barrel, so they, the barrel, you don't ever see the needle. So that's AccuCheck. They have a fair different number of options there. And so the child never has to see the needle. They feel the prick, <laughs> but they don't see the needle. As far as giving insulin, you can give insulin in the back of uh, your area here. You can give it in the back of your arm here. So they don't necessarily have to see it. You can distract, you can sing, you can have the other child do antics while you're giving the insulin. I mean, all kinds of different things. It actually hurts less for an insulin shot than it does to prick your finger. The, another question that came in, they asked, how often should we test children's blood sugar to screen for juvenile diabetes? So you need to talk to your pediatrician about your family history of diabetes, because they're both genetically oriented diseases, although there are people who develop them that are unaware of any family history of that. But currently, it's a pretty strong belief system that it's genetically related. And so let your pediatrician know, but at least annually. Joining us again today is Dr. Rebecca Dennison, uh, Doctor of Integrative Medicine, Diabetes Educator, Dietitian with the Gecko Diabetes and Nutrition Center at GBMC. Uh, Dr. Dennison, quick question for you. If somebody wants to find out more information about certain programs that are offered at, at the center or to find out just some more information about diabetes, what's a, be a good resource, a GBMC resource for them to go to? So gbmc.org slash diabetes is, is a good resource. And also, if you're trying to get an appointment at the Geckel Diabetes and Nutrition Center where I work, it's 443-849-2036, and they can give you some information too. You know, I just touched upon programs, and one of the programs that's offered at um, the Geckel Diabetes and Nutrition Center is called the Diabetes Days Program. It's a Diabetes Days Program at GBMC. Can you educate our audience and those watching us on Facebook, what is the Diabetes Days program at GBMC? So it's a collaboration with um, the Geckel Diabetes and Nutrition Center and the GBMC Health Partners Physicians who have offices in the extending community. So Joppa Road, Hunt Valley, Hunt Manor, Texas Station, Owens Mills. Um, there's a few others I didn't say, but so we go there, we meaning the people that are all registered dietitians and certified diabetes educators at the Geckel Center. We go once a month to these physicians' offices, sort of one-stop shop kind of concept, <laughs> and um, we see patients there and give them individualized care and collaborate with the, their physicians as well. Who, um, who qualifies for the Diabetes Day program? So a person that is diagnosed with diabetes and um, someone who is seeing one of these GBMC health partners. We're going to get back to the Diabetes Days program, but I know we have a question from our audience. Laura? All right. So the question that we have is that in some extreme cases of diabetes, you hear about people losing fingers and toes. What is the cause of that? Okay. So one of the complications that can be associated with diabetes is nerve damage. So the longest nerves in the body are in our feet, and the second longest nerves of the body are in our fingers. So there's a lot more known about that these days, and there's better medications these days. So 50, 60, 70 years ago, didn't know as much. But now it's recommended that you see a podiatrist at least annually for a comprehensive foot exam to see if you have any nerve damage. But the challenge can be if you have a nerve damage on your bottom of your foot and you're not looking at your foot, 
and you can't see <laughs> that there's a sore there and the sore gets infected and you don't see it until it comes around the front and that's when you have to have an amputation. So careful looking at your fingers and your toes, taking care of them, putting moisture on them, being aware of that, calling your doctor, or getting an appointment right away if you have a problem, if you can't fix it yourself, that generally. And then the long term, keep your blood sugars under good control. <laughs> that helps too. <laughs> Let me go back to the Diabetes Days program. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we wanted to ask you was, what are some of the key topics that are covered in the diabetes education classes you all provide? So there are seven behaviors that the American Diabetes Association has decided through research, people need to understand and use to very successfully manage their diabetes and have a healthy long life. So healthy eating is one of those, being active is one of those, coping is another one, um, monitoring, taking your medications, problem solving, trying to figure out what you need to do to get a certain thing, and reducing your risk. So that would be seeing the doctors at the right time, getting your labs taken appropriately so that you know if you're getting risk developing. What age group is mostly commonly seen and educated uh, in these programs? So typically we see anywhere from 25 to 75. Um, we do see younger, we do see older, but that tends to be our age range that we see mostly. And the last question that actually came in um, before our program today, what is the best way to get involved with Diabetes Days if you are new to the community or recently diagnosed with diabetes? So diabetes, um, sorry, gbmc.org slash find a doctor might be find a doc instead, but one of those, <laughs> is going to help you find out a primary care physician. And then as long as they agree that you have diabetes, then you're appropriate for diabetes days. But I do want to add that we at the main center at GBMC will see you um, whether you have a GBMC position or not. <laughs> so our main center, we're there Monday through Friday as well. Again, joining us today, uh, Dr. Rebecca Dennison, Doctor of Integrative Medicine, Diabetes Educator and Dietitian with the Gecko Diabetes Center at G uh, Di Gecko Diabetes and Nutrition <laughs> Center at GBMC joining us today. Again, I encourage you all, if you have any questions, please provide them in the comment section on our Facebook page. And our audience members, please see Laura uh, to provide your questions to her, and she'll do her best to ask them before our show uh, finishes for the day, which we only have a few more minutes. Uh, Laura, you do have a question. I have three, actually. Fantastic. So I'm going to combine two of them. So the question is, what helps unlock the cells to let insulin function well? And then what is the best A1C level to have? Okay, I'm gonna do the second one first. So normal A1C for someone without diabetes is 4.0 to 5.6. Pre-diabetes is 5.7 to 6.4, and diabetes is 6.5 or higher. However, the research shows that you just need to keep your A1C under 7%. Um, to, to avoid all the complications associated with diabetes, partly because when you start getting tighter blood sugar control, you can have some lows too, and the A1C is only an average. So it, you can actually look like it's good and have a lot of lows and a lot of highs. Um, the other question was how to unlock the cell. So exercise is the best thing, movement. We are designed to move. We should be moving at least every hour that we're awake. We should be doing a minimum of 30 to 60 minutes a day, the little Fitbits with the 10,000 steps gives us an idea and a little let us know if you haven't done 250 steps in an hour. <laughs> and so exercise is good. Um, keeping that stress level down or well managed, though deep breaths can help tell your body that you don't need the stress hormones to fight or flee, can be helpful getting enough sleep. Can't push that enough, <laughs> but we've got to have a balanced lifestyle where we have some social, we have some things that are challenging our intellect, it could be work, it could be other things. So you, you have a spiritual or some kind of connection to a bigger thing, whether it be a whatever way you perceive spiritual. So you need all of that to have a healthy uh, lifestyle, which will help the insulin work better. Any more questions there, Laura? Yes, we do have one more. Okay. Um, how does diabetes affect eyesight, ultimately leading to blindness? So, uh, some of the when you have high blood sugar it's a little bit like honey going through your veins rather than water and so some of the smaller blood vessels are in the eye and so it's hard to get the nourishment to the eye if the blood sugar is too high 
So the best way to prevent eye disease is one, having good blood sugar control as well as you can. Some bodies cooperate more than others, <laughs> so sometimes that's hard, but also seeing an eye doctor for a diabetes eye exam at least annually. If they perceive a problem, they will tell you to come more frequently. Uh, we had a question that was submitted on the comment section of our Facebook page. It says, if your child is obese, can you repeat the early warning signs for type 2 or type 1 diabetes? So the early warning signs for type, um, for any type of di diabetes is that you have unexplained weight loss that's fast, you have blurry vision, you have extreme thirst, excessive urination, and if you're a child, bedwetting. Um, if those can be things for other things as well. <laughs> so it's best to go to your physician and have it have them screened for diabetes. So I'm glad we, because we only have a few more minutes left on our program today, I wanna talk about parents and, and their role in the, in taking care of, a, of their child who's got type two diabetes or even type one. Um, one of the questions that came in is, what are some important tips to parents with children who have been diagnosed with type two diabetes? So I think one of the best things is it needs to be a family affair. And the whole family needs to eat healthier and be involved, and especially the adults in the family, because they're the role models. The kids are gonna be looking to you to see what you're doing. And um, the simplest explanation of how to eat is the plate method, where half your plate's vegetables, the size of your fist is carbohydrates, and so a child's fist is smaller than an adult's fist, and the size of the palm of your hand for protein. And again, the child's hand is smaller than yours, so they shouldn't be eating the same portions. Um, and we all need to not do sweetened beverages. All right, we got two more questions. Um, what kind of health complications are children with type two diabetes susceptible to? So kidney, eye disease, amputations, um, heart is, is the main ones. And so as a person with diabetes, whether it's type one or type two, you need to be seeing your uh, physician regularly so that those can be screened because almost all of those, you can't fix them once they started to occur. You wanna find out right away when they're starting to occur um, so that they can be fixed. Okay. Well, and not gotten worse, sorry. <laughs> what is the best type of diet for kids with either type one or type two diabetes? So that would be um, consistent small portions. We should never be above a scale of one to 10, uh, one being you're starving, 10 being you're really full like Thanksgiving day. We should always be staying around a four or six and most of us like being eight, nine and 10. I, I'll be honest, I do too. <laughs> so, so we need to learn better what is hunger and what is fullness. Uh, and again, I think we can't stress enough. I wanna go back about the vision loss. I, I, you know, I, you know, with diabetes, of course, you know, vision is affected. Uh, we see in adults a lot. So I, I'm, I'm thankful to you for at least reminding our audience and those <laughs> watching us how important it is for their child to see a pediatric optometrist to get their vision checked out mm -hmm. and how important it is to make sure that those appointments are, are kept um, uh, on time and, yes. and, and, mm -hmm. and are seen through. Dr. Dennison, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and for, for providing our audience and those watching us at home with some important information and about the Diabetes Day program. Um, that sounds like a great program for, for our patients within, pro within our you know, GBMC health partners and also for those that are coming to the Geckel Diabetes and Nutrition Center. I can't thank you enough for joining Thanks us for having today. Me. Um, before we close out, the um, discussion on diabetes continues with Mary Beth Marzin on Greater Living. Uh, hey, Mary Beth. She's back there talking to our producer, Mindy. She's, she's. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's okay, because tomorrow, you know, I want to uh, remind our audience, we talked about it last month. Tomorrow we are holding our blood drive at GBMC. For some more information on that, it's gbmc.org slash red. Cross. We hope to see you there. If you have a heart, come on out. Give out. Give some blood. Uh, we really do need it. And uh, I, my guest from last month, uh, Bree Rogers, who's our coordinator, um, you know, reminded me to just, you know, give a gentle reminder to you all. Mary Beth, you and I have an appointment tomorrow. I think. 
Yeah, you and I holding hands while we give blood? What do you say, huh? What do you say? What do you say? <laughs> uh, join us here next month as we talk about colon cancer and some exciting news on what we're doing as far as the treatment for colon cancer and also prevention uh, methods at uh, GBMC. On a personal, I just want to say, I want to give my best wishes to my goddaughter, Electra, who actually had some surgery yesterday. I wish you a speedy recovery, sweetheart. Your godmother and I love you very much, and we know you have a long road ahead, but we hope for all the best and pray for all the best to you um, in the next coming months. So with that said, till next month, cheers to your health.